case. Yeah. <laughs> I just started the video. I'm just going to kneel down here so I'm in the camera. And I just want to say that uh, a lot of you know Judith Nelson. And uh, she and Carol are on their annual week's retreat in, Est in Grand Lake. And um, you know Judith loves her red wine. But uh, we're recording this so that I can surprise Judith and Carol when they get back. And there are a number of other people who have expressed interest in the program. And just thought it'd be really nice to uh, record for them. And uh, we've even got some who are out of the country. So uh, your audience will be more than double what you're currently seeing. <laughs> anyway, we're very pleased to have Bill St. John. He's uh, a, a much appreciated uh, food and wine critic with the Denver Post. He's syndicated all over the country. And um, I found the article that Judith sent me, and I think it was the Mother's Day um, column uh, about your family experience, and uh, it, it's just an amazing article. Uh, and if someone's interested, I, I can share it at a later time. But um, Judith, uh, I was at a potluck with Judith. She, she asked me, had I followed up with you? And I hadn't done so. So that's the point at which a day or so later, I finally contacted you and was so happy that you were available on our day. So, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Bill St. John to share a little, uh, also on the theme of authenticity, sort of a foundation for our upcoming symposium in October. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tim, for introducing me. Thank you. Rick, uh, Daryl, uh, Jason, Bob, Jerry, Judith, Sasha. Oh, I'm impressed. Very good. <laughs> That's really good. I work on my, against my Alzheimer's that way. <laughs> so, um, Tim asked me, you know, what can you talk about? And, and I, he told me about your upcoming discussions of um, authenticity, diversity, um, and um, I said, well, you know, there's, a, there's been a big discussion for years about what are authentic recipes, what's, what's the authentic X. Um, and um, I said, maybe I can do some I'm thinking about or research in the idea of authentic recipes as that might relate to how to, a person might lead an authentic life. Like, are there any clues that food and cooking gives us that um, we can relate to our own personal lives? So that's what I'm about to do uh, today. Um, I wanted to go through uh, four examples of um, foods that we are perhaps very or somewhat familiar with, and then try to tie something together at the end of that with the idea of uh, an authentic, how, what it means to lead an authentic life. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I would start with the, the lowest hanging fruit uh, <laughs> to start with. No, no puns intended <laughs> with this crowd. <laughs> you might even call it the lowest hanging pinata because yes. it's, it's easily attacked. And that is the Caesar salad. Um, it, it wasn't named after uh, Julius Caesar. It was named after a man by the name of um, Cesare Cardini, or Cesar, who um, emigrated from Italy. He was born in the uh, late 1800s, 1896. He moved to this country the early 1900s and was working as a restaurateur, mostly in California, but also in New York City. Um, and then Prohibition hit, and he his restaurants weren't doing very well because, as you probably know, um, wine and liquor sales are a big deal for restaurants. And so he moved to Tijuana, New Mexico, and yeah, because they didn't have a Prohibition there. And he established a restaurant under his name. It was Caesar's Restaurant, Cesar. And, um, the, the legend goes, and it might be true, his daughter Jane wrote about this years later, that one night he needed to kind of use up some stuff that he had around the kitchen, and he composed this salad of full stalks of romaine lettuce, raw egg, extra virgin olive oil, croutons, grated Parmigiano-Reggiano, and Worcestershire sauce. I mean, you know, he just, that's all it was, the original 
Salad Cesar, right? Or Sal mm -hmm. Salada Cesar. And, and, and that's, that's the original Caesar salad. And um, it quickly caught on in this country, but as you know from just your own experience with menus or anything else, it has just gone off crazy. <laughs> And uh, in the mid 1900s, you know, Seder died in the. Uh, I think he died in 1952, a couple years after I was born. But the people started adding anchovies and lots of garlic and vinegar or lemon juice, lots of uh, black pepper. You know, the big meal at the, and it was being done by at table side to, to impress the guest because this is pretty cheap food actually. You know, so <laughs> bowl, dress it up with a little theater. Um, the, the lettuce wasn't the whole stock, so it was torn up and, and cut up so people could eat it more easily. Um, there was Dijon mustard mixed in. And then, in the, in the mid-1900s and later on, there's chicken Caesar salad, kale Caesar salad, pasta Caesar salad, vegan Caesar salad with chickpeas instead of croutons, um, grilled asparagus Caesar salad, salmon on top of Caesar salad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so the question becomes, um, what is the authentic recipe for salad, salad a Cesar, or Caesar salad? Is it, is it the one that Cesar came up with, and that's all? Or all these other things that have the name Caesar salad? Just a question. Second food, cassoulet, a, a wonderful dish from southwestern France, um, which started in the 1300s, actually with uh, the villagers in the southwestern part of France in the Languedoc district. Languedoc, by the way, is a fascinating word itself. Long means language or tongue. D means of, and then ac. The Occitan people in the southern part of France said the word yes by using the word ac instead of the word oui, which the northerners used for saying the word yes. So the, the, there's, a, there's a, a line through the middle of France that is the southern part, the long duck, the language of the people who say ah for yes, <laughs> and the northern part. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So um, these people would just take uh, white beans that they would have, broad beans, uh, be, uh, before Columbus, then they got the white beans from our um, continent, and, uh, our part of the world, excuse me, not our continent, actually from South America, um, and just scraps of meat, little pieces of fat back uh, from their pigs, or uh, lamb, or duck, carcasses that they would peel the meat off of and so forth and so on. It was, a, it was a poor person's dish, the original cassoulet. However, it's taken on a life of its own, um, especially in the late 1800s and, and, and now. There's a 600, excuse me, a 100 mile or 60, a 100 kilometer or 60 mile stretch along the Canal du Midi, which is in the southwestern part of France, on which lie three different towns. And they are all makers of cassoulet in their own style. Mm -hmm. And they say that their cassoulet is the authentic cassoulet, okay? And those towns, there's uh, the, first, uh, the first author of the La Russe Gastronomique was a man, um, I forget his first name, but his name was Montagnier. And he wrote about these three towns, saying that for this area of the world, cassoulet was God, G-O-D capital GOT, and that in Castel Nodri, one of these towns, the first one closest to the Mediterranean, we're going to go from the Mediterranean up through the, the Midi towards Bordeaux and the Atlantic, okay, on our little trip here. So Castel Nodri makes their cassoulet with various cuts of pork <coughs> plus a piece of ham. They also use a bean called the Ligno, L-I-N-G-O-T, um, which is a long white bean, hard bean resistant to breaking down. Cassoulet takes hours to cook, and so you want a bean that's going to be able to resist this long cooking. Um, and and, and Montagnier said that Castel Nocli was God the Father. <laughs> the next town, Carcassonne, which you may have visited because it's a very big tourist attraction in southern France, was God the Son. Um, they took the same kind of recipe that Castel Nocli did with the beans and the pork and so forth, but they added a lamb shank and a partridge. <laughs> and then the third town, farther up, is Toulouse. And um, that was God the Holy Spirit. And, uh, oh, excuse me, in Carcassonne, they also use a different kind of bean called the Tarbe, T-A-R-B-A-I-S. It's the bean that I like to use when I make cassoulet during the wintertime. I make 
five or six, seven cassoulets during the course of the winter um, myself, because I, I really like making it, and um, it's, it's my favorite bean. I get it from a guy in California called um, Steve Sando. He has a bean company out of Napa Valley. He grows Tarbe, the authentic, well, I guess that's our <laughs> <laughs> the authentic um, Tarbe bean um, in California. And in Toulouse, they take the same recipe as um, Castor and with various kinds of pork and so forth, but they omit the ham, and instead they put a kofi of duck leg and a fresh Toulouse pork sausage, which is kind of a garlicky, ground up pork sausage. Mm -hmm. So they also use the tarbe bean. Nowadays, Castel Lotri doesn't use the ham. They've taken that away. Nowadays, Carcassonne doesn't have any partridge. Um, and often, they don't use their lamb shank anymore. And Toulouse almost always includes the confit of duck, the fresh Toulouse pork sausage. The recipes that you'll probably find, the one I published that they never posted a few months ago, was a Toulousian recipe. That is to say, pork pieces, seven different kinds of pork, the tarbe beans, um, Toulouse sausage, which you can get kind of a, a version of at Marzik's Fine Food on 17th, and also um, a confit of duck. By the way, I have a great recipe for you can, doing your own confit of duck leg, which is a lot cheaper than buying it off the, you know, from someone else. So basically what we've got here in, in Cassoulet are these three towns that say make, they make the authentic Cassoulet. Right? We'll come back to this. Now, a, a famous argument that's been had for many, many years about salade soise. You probably had one this summer somewhere, because it's very popular in the summertime. Um, there's a great book I use in some of my classes by Waverly Root, who was a journalist who wrote for the Chicago Tribune, as I did, I was very proud of that, and the New York Times, um, and the Washington Post, some other newspapers. He was a, pretty much a war correspondent in the Second World War, uh, but he, uh, he died in 1952. No, excuse me, he died in 1982, but he uh, did a lot of uh, traveling around both Italy and France, and he wrote two wonderful books called The Food of Italy and The Food of France. And in The Food of France, he says about the Salade de Soise, it is innocent of lettuce and must contain tomatoes cut into wedges not slices, and should contain and should contain nothing cooked, with the possible exception of hard-boiled egg, not often permitted in Nice itself. Nice is as far uh, southwest in France as you, you can get before you pop into Italy. It's like I I looked up in Colorado. That's it's like Campo, Colorado. It's like it's the farthest north, excuse me, southeastern part of uh, France, and it's along the Mediterranean. And, and they will find out in a minute. They're sort of their characteristics for their food, but it, no lettuce, must have tomatoes, should contain nothing cooked. Now you've had a salad in spots with stuff that's been cooked. Everyone has, with the possible exception of a hard boiled egg. Outside of Nice, and as close as Paris itself, the salad in Soise, he says, writes, often sports green beans and potatoes both cooked, though a purist would regard either of these, especially the latter, that is to say the cooked with horror. <laughs> in Nice, they also use these beautiful little black olives that they call the, the Niçoise. They're really small, big pit, so there's not a lot of fruit. They're brine cured, unpitted. Um, sweet green pepper, bell pepper. Uh, fava beans, or fev in French, which they either blanch or serve fresh if they're just right out of the pot. They don't cook them. Um, radishes sometimes, and uh, ground anchovies. Anyway, um, that's what, that is what supposedly is the classic salad de soise. And we, if you, if you think, where's the tuna? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this, was, this was written by Jacques Médecin. His name actually means J uh, James the Doctor. <laughs> Jacques Médecin. And he was the mayor of the town of Nice in the, in the 50s. And he wrote a book called Cuisine Niçoise, The Cooking of Nice. It's supposed to be an authoritative um, description of the cooking of his area, of his town. Quote, the Niçois, a person from Nice, often combine anchovies and tuna fish in the same salad. Traditionally, this was never done, tuna fish being very expensive and reserved for special occasions, so the cheaper anchovies fill the bill. 
Waverly root does not even mention tuna fish as a possibility in the classic dish. So uh, now almost every salad you saw has, has tuna fish. The kind of tuna fish that we like to see on a salad you saw very often is grilled, raw centered, sushi grade tuna. To quote Kevin McAllister's older sister in the first Home Alone movie, <laughs> you Americans, you are incompetent, incompetent. <laughs> no one, no one in Nice, no one in the entire country of France would add grilled tuna to a salad niçoise. <laughs> <laughs> and if it is canned tuna, it's canned in olive oil, never water. Julia Child, who I'll be speaking about a little bit more in a minute, high pitchedly uh, uh, warbled for uh, some people at the uh, Food and Wine Classic up in Aspen in one year. I was there for 17 years in a row, um, speaking myself. This is what Julie Child said. <clears throat> I'm going to try to imitate her as well. <laughs> Tuna in water? Well, that's simply rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so for Anishwaz, it's always canned tuna in oil. Really high quality, line caught canned tuna in olive oil, not just any oil. And um, so it occurred to me when I was writing this down, thinking about this, that there are a lot of um, ways of describing cooking that talk about a la flamand, a la niçoise. You know, you'll notice, by the way, that it's always female. It's not a le niçoise, it's a la niçoise, the feminine. Because the assumption is that the cook is a female, right? Because that was a woman's work, which is ironic because nowadays it's mostly male work almost, almost exclusively in some cases. The women, the women, women still do a lot of cooking in the home, of course, but the point I'm trying to make is that the traditional way of re referring to these kinds of cooking methods is feminine. And you'll see it in Italian, a la Fiorentina, that's feminine. You'll see it in Spanish. I can't get something off the top of my head that way, but the point is it's almost always feminine. Very interesting kind of little side note on culinary history. So what is a la niçoise? How do you prepare foods a la niçoise? Not just a salad, but anything. So a la niçoise, according to the La Rousse Gastronomique, contain things, these five things, garlic, olives, anchovies, tomatoes, and what we call haricot vert, those little thin green beans. Mm -hmm. Those five things are a la niçoise. So for example, when they grill a mullet or a red snapper in Nice or near Nice, and they finish it off a la niçoise, they make a sauce of chopped, uh, coarsely peeled, peeled, chopped, peeled, coarsely chopped tomatoes, anchovy fillets, anchovy butter, and olives. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a la niçoise, of grilled fish. They make a sauce for chicken and meat, which is a la niçoise, which are tomatoes stewed in oil and garlic, chopped up, ground a bit, buttered haricot vert, or small zucchini. Again, those classic kind of things for a la niçoise are taken up to mean those kinds of preparations for those foods. This book is my mother's, she's gone now, but um, it has from Julia Child's Kitchen, it's an old book called Vida. It's one of those great cookbooks with tomato stains and beef broth stains and so forth. And it actually has Julia Child's autograph in the front yeah. from, that my mom got from her. I don't know exactly where, I don't remember. But I'm honored to own it and I use it myself. I'm not gonna imitate Julia Child throughout this whole book. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what she says. We all right? Yeah. Okay. Obviously, she says this is, it is one of those recipes like bouillabaisse and chicken marengo. You pretty much do what you want and declare emphatically, like any proper French cook, that yours is the one and only real, authentic, and serious, and veritable salad de soise. All of the elements of the salad may be prepared in advance, but it must not be dressed and arranged until just before serving. I deplore 
I deplore <laughs> the system employed by many restaurants and even individuals, including some of my friends, of making a beautiful arrangement in a salad bowl, then pouring on the draw, the dressing, and mixing it all up. A horrid mess, and it is not right, no! <laughs> Exclamation point. Her own salad niçoise includes what, are, what is called pomme de terre à l'huile, a small, simple potato salad, cooked, of course, with a nice little vinaigrette of olive oil, herbs, uh, lemon juice or vinegar, anchovies, capers, a head of Boston lettuce, ripe tomatoes cut up, haricot vert blanched or, and then chilled, hard boiled eggs, black olives, canned tuna with, uh, in olive oil, and chopped parsley. The only thing that everybody has in their salad niçoise, all the salad niçoise that I read about are tomatoes. Lots of other different variables. Fourth food, green chili, the, the <laughs> chili verde, what was advertised as tonight's sort of, is there an authentic recipe for chili verde? And if, if there is, can it teach us anything about life? living authentically. No, there is no canonical version of Chile Verde. <laughs> oh, okay, your grandmother's is the real Chile Verde. Yeah, that's almost exactly where you where you come down to this thing, because that, I went and did a Google search in English for um, authentic Chile Verde, more than 200 returns. I didn't even do google.mx like, to go in Spanish and find out what they had to say. I just said, what the fuck, this is like too much. <laughs> you know, they're every, like, <laughs> Padma Lakshmi has a recipe for it. Rachel Ray has one. Of course, Martha Stewart has one. All the cooking shows. Who watches the cooking shows, you guys? Joe with the, you yeah. know, like, all the, all the cooking shows you know about, all the cooking magazines, like Bon Appetit, Sever, Gourmet, they all have a chili, authentic chili verde recipe. Not just chili verde, authentic chili verde. <laughs> I, I, I make that point. Um, so if you yourself, uh, and you may have done this, if you travel the Southwest and dip into Mexico itself, you'll notice that the Chile Verde that you have varies from town to town. You might even say, as Daryl I think just pointed out, from Casa to or no, Jerry, it was you, from Casa to Casa, you know, like it's your mom's. And so um, the, the only ingredient, like the tomatoes in Salad Nisuaz, but the only ingredient that you find in all Chile Verdes is the Verde part, the chiles. Mm -hmm. um, in many places, you don't even find pork. There are lots of Mexican recipes for Chile Verde that are with pork broth, but not with pork meat. Mm -hmm. um, and, or sometimes chicken broth, not pork at all. Um, and however, the, the, the chiles themselves vary as well. So let's go a little bit into that. In Mexico, for chiles, they commonly use poblano and um, a combo of jalapeno and poblano, along with almost always tomatillos, which are those gooseberry-like um, plants. We, we might think that they're related to the tomato, but they're not. They're more related to the gooseberry. They add a lot of bright acidity and freshness to uh, the cooking of Mexico. In Mexico as well, chile verde is simply often just a sauce which adorns other cooked foods like grilled chicken or barbecue chicken or ro uh, roasted pork or grilled pork. Um, and it is, it is something that you put over those meats or accompany with it. And also many tortilla-based foods, enchiladas and other kinds of dishes are doused with chile verde. The best example of this you can get in Denver is, El, is at El Taco de Mexico over on Santa Fe and 7th. They, their chile verde is a very soupy, and, and they've also they've sort of sought to, to the Denverites and the Americans, they put meat in it so you can get, if you want their famous burrito slathered with chili verde, it doesn't have a lot of chunky meat in it, it's a sauce. Um, and um, different than what we normally consider to be green chili or chili verde. In New Mexico, it is practically the state dish. However, it varies very, very much from town to town and from, um, in, some, in some places, big cities like Santa Fe, when you're going to be there, you'll notice that there are chili verdes of different kinds in different parts of the city. So the, the main thing that they do in, in, in 
New Mexico is to adhere to their state's famous hatch chili, which is a mammoth producer of green chiles. And they're very, very protective of that. They're very proud of that. Moving up in geography a little bit, New, Mex New Mexicans look upon Colorado's versions of chile verde as inauthentic. <laughs> Why? Because even though there are, again, dozens and dozens of versions of Chile Verde throughout Colorado, even many in Denver, there, there are dozens of Chile Verdes in Denver that are very different from each other. Um, we use tomatoes in a lot of our Chile Verde. That's anathema to a Mexican or a New Mexican. We thicken our Chile Verde with masa or cornstarch or horror, as she would say, potatoes. <laughs> very looked down upon by New Mexican noses. <laughs> if you go to the Cherry Cricket in Cherry Creek, they have two chili verdes on the menu, one which is their standard for years that they're very proud of, but one that also won a contest that they had for the authentic chili verde a few years ago that they had to put on the menu because it won and because people wanted it and people kept asking for it, but they didn't get rid of their own. But they're vastly different from each other. One's hotter than the other, one has big pieces of meat and than the other. One has more tomatoes than the other, but they're both authentic chile verdes. You get what I'm saying here? <laughs> we in Colorado also tend to favor our, our own state's chile, the Pueblo chile, if you can find it. The, the production of Pueblo is vastly um, over, over, they make a hell of a lot more hatch than, than, than uh, Pueblo. But we use a lot of jalapeno uh, in our chile verde. Uh, some poblano, but mostly jalapeno. So let's look at the idea of authenticity in these three locales. In Mexico, it's a combo of poblano and jalapeno chiles, along with tomatillos, often simply a sauce or a salsa for other foods. In New Mexico, it is hatched chiles, very few thickeners, no or few tomatoes. In Colorado, it's jalapeno and pueblo, or jalapeno or pueblo chiles, tomatoes, and sometimes, well, very often, thickeners. So why is that the case? Why are those three authentic Chile Verdes, in a way, so different from each other? Well, in Mexico, that's what their place grows, are poblanos and jalapenos. And they've done that for a long time. It's, the, it's sort of terroir-driven down there, that the, they choose those chiles over, um, well, they don't grow hatch in Pueblo chiles. As, as you can. They don't grow. Big gyms, they don't grow anaheims, um, except for export. Uh, it's also a terroir in the sense of craft. It's what the people have made of the earth and the products of the earth over a very long period of time in Mexico. They made this kind of Chile Verde because these are the things that they have that are available to them over time that they have always dealt with, that their mama has always. See what I'm saying? It's, it's a, it has to do a lot with, with locale and tradition and terroir. In New Mexico, the answer to the question of why they make their Chile Verde this way is that they have hatch and they have developed their local traditions. They're proud of what they do, understandably. Again, very localized, very terroir driven in a sense if you think of hatch chilies growing in hatch New Mexico as terroir, which it is. In Colorado, I'm just surmising, I think it's, you know, it's colder up here than it is in New Mexico and Mexico. Why not up the heat level with jalapenos? They add a punch. Pueblos add a punch that these other Chile poblanos don't have the same kind of fire. And I use that word exactly how I mean it, fire, to heat up the body um, that uh, jalapenos and pueblos have. As for tomatoes and thickeners, again, it, they make a, it makes a more filling dish against the, against the cold. It makes a more hearty stew, if you will, against the cold, especially with big chunks of pork if you can afford it. But it's also notable that we are, we're poorer people at the initial time of the development of Chile Verde. And tomatoes and potatoes and masa stretch the Chile Verde for poorer people. Our indigenous Spaniards and our Mexican immigrants didn't have the same resources to make expensive Chile Verdes as people in um, other places where those kinds of foods were more readily available to them, and, and that maybe not as expensive. 
it's interesting, I have a friend who's a cook who made, I was talking to him about this yesterday, he made a batch, an identical batch, two identical recipes of chile verde using hatched chiles and pueblo chiles. And he didn't tell people what they were. And no one, his wife who was a very skilled uh, Epicurean, and other, could tell the difference. Mm -hmm. So, in, in the case of Chile Verde, this you know massive uh, variety of things, it comes down to locality, terroir, economy. It comes down to mostly something I wrote about today in the Denver Post, that which is close to the source, or closest to the source. So, authenticity in life. How do I make this, how, how am I gonna make the leap from these foods that we've just been talking about, that I've just been talking about, to the idea of what it means to live an authentic life? The, the Greek origins of the word authentic are the word otos, which means self, and gentes, which means doer or accomplisher. So a self-doer, a self-accomplisher. That word developed in time around the 14th century to the word meaning real, accepted as fact, trustworthy, reliable, as in an authentic retelling of the story. And then in turn, towards the 18th century, authenticity initially came to mean made or done in the traditional or original way, or in a way that faithfully resembles the original undisputed origin. And then up into the 20th century, the word kept that traditional meaning, meanings actually, but also now one added by existentialist philosophy to be a significant, purposive, responsible mode of human living. So for recipes, it seems to me that the best thing I can do to say you know, a recipe is authentic is I want to say, how close is it to the source? But the sources, you know, Cesar was one source, Nice is one source, Cassoulet is three sources, and Chile Verde is hundreds of sources of authenticities. Not to mention there's translation in the way those are written. Perhaps. For persons, this is where I make the leap. For persons, you are the source. So going back to the Greek, as it were, authentes, meaning to be authentic, is to act on one's own authority. Act out of one's knowledge of one's inner self, of who one truly is, as one knows that. How do I know what I know about me? What do I know about me? And do I outer that from the source? It's, it's quintessentially Greek. You know, they, they came up with this phrase thousands of years ago. Know thyself. You can't lead a life without knowing thyself. And, and the Roman philosophers took it a step further, but they translated it word for word. Noxhe te ipsum. No, noxhe, no, te thy ipsum self. Know thyself. It's a byword of these two histories of philosophy, the Greek and the Roman. Know thyself, then go. I think there's a similar idea that would be that there is a correspondence between one who knows oneself to be and how one acts. In reality, in reality, it seems to me it's almost like who one acts. It's not how, but who one acts. You could call this integrity, or wholeness, from the Latin word integer, or whole. We use the same in mathematics to mean a whole number, not a fraction. So we understand the notion of someone having integrity, but I'm speaking here about one being being whole. So I'm going to use myself and my own life examples. These are two things that I know 
these two things I'm about to talk about are not the whole of me, the entirety of what I know Bill St. John to be or feel or think, but they are good examples for this purpose of this discussion. When I looked inside of myself and knew these things about the source of myself as, a, as the source of myself, to be authentic, I needed to do certain things. I needed to act in certain ways. It's, it's like a recipe. What's, what's the source, and how do I outer that source? Do you see what I'm making? That kind of, that kind of leap. So I identify as gay, and, and I'm in recovery from alcoholism. Those are the two things I'm just going to talk about briefly. So I came out of the closet in 1996. I was 46 years old. I've been married for many years. I got married in 1974 to a wonderful woman who's still my best friend, um, the person I feel most comfortable with. We have a wonderful son. He's 38. But that second suicide attempt was great motivator to, mm -hmm. to get me to, to know who I was, to look inside of who am I, to know, to noshe te ipsum, and, and then be that. You see what I'm saying? I knew who I was, and I just had to do it. I love how we use the word out, because it, it literally means out of a closet. I came out. I, I, I came out. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Also, I'm in recovery from alcoholism. I cannot hold my liquor. <laughs> That's why I don't write about wine anymore. I have been a great wine writer. I've written thousands of reviews on wine. I own two wine schools. I taught hundreds of people about wine. I was, I spoke around the world on wine. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying this is a fact. They, I mean, I was well respected. I knew my shit, but I don't hadn't done it for five years because a glass of rosé is a short route to a bottle of vodka for me. And I've tested that over and over and over again for thirty years. I've been in and out of recovery, in and out of rehabs, in and out of sobriety, in and out of AA for close to thirty years. Right now, I'm sober. I'm glad about that. When, when I'm sober, I know who I am, and I have to out it. I have to be it. I can't hold my liquor. I'd rather it was different, right? But it's not. I sometimes talk about myself as a bag of molecules. I'm just a bag of molecules, a big pink bag of molecules. <laughs> I was at a, I was at a um, funeral once. This guy's laid out, his husband, he's laid out in his casket. Everybody's going by and offering condolences to the wife. And, and um, people said things that they say at funerals, like, oh, he's in a better place. Or he's at peace now. Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's no he there anymore. He, his bag of molecules is deteriorating. And it will continue to deteriorate and, and, and fall apart over a short period of time until it's just dust, until dust you return. He isn't anywhere else. <laughs> you, you know, you may have some ideas about soul and so forth and so on. I don't want to dispute those or talk about those, but I, what I'm trying to say is that his bag of molecules is galling. You can't do anything about that. And I said to myself, who am I slash he? Who's he? I'm this bag of molecules. They are arranged in a certain way that when you open the bag and you pour in ethanol, it gets fucked up. <laughs> Those molecules have a really difficult time dealing with life. Okay? That is the arrangement that I am. I can't do anything about it. I can't change the arrangement of the molecules. You may Assuming, assuming that that's the case, because statistically it is, have a different arrangement of your bag of molecules. And you can put all the ethanol in it if you want, and it doesn't get fucked up. But this one can't. So I have to own that. I have to know who I am. I have to know me. And if I'm off, 
authentic, right? If I'm self-governing, then I have to manage me, this me, this E, the way it is. Not the way I wish it was, not the, wish I, the way I hoped it could be, not to be in a better place. No, it's just this. Mindfulness, acceptance, really important things for me in this authenticity business. So I try to li live an authentic life by knowing who I am and how I am, and then you know, honoring that in my actions as best I can. Like I said, those two things, being gay and an alcoholic, those are <laughs> that's not the whole of me, I hope. <laughs> There's a lot of other stuff that I know I am. Well, that's me. That's what I've got to say for authenticity in food and, and authenticity in life. Thank you very much. I'd like you to say something about uh, how authenticity has played out in your family interaction. Uh, I read that you've had a couple of oils Siblings. Yeah, you yeah. come from a large family, and um, are you seeing parallels with others, or are the well? I learned a lot from my yeah. So uh, there are nine of us. I'm the eldest of nine, and like the way I put it, it'll be crude, but excuse me. The the, oh, the the eldest and the youngest are faggots, and there's a dike in between. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <coughs> the uh, Paul, the youngest, came out first. Annie, uh, my lesbian sister, my gay sister, she came out second. And, and I waited until I was 46. But I learned from them because they, um, they came out. They were authentic, right? And I, that, was, that was powerful teaching. Um, so it was a very kind of funny thing in, in our family. Paul was exposed. He, my, mother, my mother walked in on him at the age of 14. He was banging his boyfriend at the time. And, and that was like, ah! You know, so <laughs> she kicked him out of the house. And he, my father let him back in. And, and, and then he started dealing with his life. And he, he, um, he, he did pretty well. He's done very well. Uh, he's married now to a wonderful man from uh, Copenhagen, uh, from the Faroe Islands, actually. Live in Copenhagen, and uh, they have two boys um, that they have sired. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. The three gay children have children from their own seed or from their own egg. Mm -hmm. The six straight children, only three of them have children from their own. So the gay children are 100% fathers and mothers. <laughs> <laughs> the six straight children are 50% fathers and mothers. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> so, uh, my mother had a really difficult time with, with uh, us being gay. She never talked to me about it, for example, after I came out. She, all, she always called the other two, um, a, she, she said, Paul is a gay, uh, and Annie is a gay. My mother was from Belgium, conservative, European, um, strict. It was very difficult for her to deal with this. But it, the cool thing, and I wrote this in my Mother's Day column, is that she went to San Francisco to visit my sister Annie, who was living there at the time with her girlfriend Susie. She's no longer with Susie, but by the way, Annie has two wonderful children by uh, uh, this one man, who was a good friend of hers. But she's born both of these children and raised both of these children. They're just wonderful kids, a boy and a girl. Anyway, or a young man and a young lady, woman now. But so my mother was with Annie just visiting her because, you know, mother's going to see their daughter gay or not, right? And so she was out in San Francisco, and she noticed that Annie had a cookbook um, that was a fundraiser for uh, Project, I think it was their version of Project Angel Heart. And, um, and uh, my mother just noticed this cookbook and asked Annie about this cookbook. And then my mother came back to Denver. This was about 1990, 1991, I think. My mother came back to Denver, and without telling anybody, 
without dealing with any, you know, my mother wrote her own cookbook called Friends for Dinner, which raised over a period of two years at my father and mother's own expense $150,000 for Meals on Wheels for people with AIDS via the Volunteers of America. And that, that today's money, that's around $225,000 or something along those lines. A lot of fucking money. And my mother, um, she, she, called, she said she called it friends for dinner. I said, Mom, that sounds like cannibalism. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but she, she went around to all these. I was in the restaurant reviewing time, time of my life. You know, I knew all these chefs. I had been rest, reviewing restaurants for upwards of 20 years for the, for the Rocky Mountain News and then the Never Post. And so she went to some of these, these chefs that I knew, and she said in her, in her famous French accent, I would like to do these meals. So you come up with a menu for eight people that you would have if you were going to have your friends for dinner. And these chefs would come up with a menu with recipes. And I was, you know, drinking at the time, and so I had wine selections. I was the editor. My sister Elizabeth did the cover art. She was an artist, and so it was a kind of a family affair. But um, my mother tested every one of these recipes over, you know, a two, two-year period of time. My father told me once. He goes, Billy. Can't wait to get home. I don't know what it's going to be for dinner, but it's going to be great. Because <laughs> my mother became a really great cook. She started out awfully. She was a terrible cook when I was a, a, a little boy because she didn't learn anything from her mother. She, her mother shunned her and didn't teach her any domestic skills. So my mother's cooking was just atrocious at the beginning of our childhood. But she developed her own. She, she and she, she even got to the point of running her own cooking school out of her home, and, and uh, she's well known for it around town for people still alive. But she had, she had this cookbook. She and my father went through, it went through three printings, raised all this money, and mm -hmm. then every single dime of it went to Meals on Wheels for People with AIDS. Um, she would make hundreds of chocolate truffles by hand. She would roll them, um, and she would take them on a tray, and she'd go down to the old tattered cover, and she would set up a card table outside. If you bought a copy of the book, she would autograph it, of course, and she would give you two or three chocolate truffles. <laughs> hundreds of chocolate truffles, hundreds of books, hundreds of hours. That's how my mother dealt with her children being gay. And that's fine by me. And she died never having talked to me about it. I was telling some people at a meeting the other day about my it wasn't an AA meeting, it was another recovery group, but <laughs> I, uh, one guy said, they're gonna write on your team's on your team stone, on your tombstone, <laughs> he was the last to know. <laughs> we we had a we had a 13 I when I came out, we I had to come out and out of the house. Because we you know, and we had to tell a 13 and a half year old boy that his father was gay and that he was leaving the family that day to go live in another place. And, you know, so we went to Penny, my wife at the time, my ex-wife, Penny and I went to therapy. We talked to counselors, what kind of questions might he ask? How do we deal with this? What do we, you know, like, how do we do with those? So we decided that we were gonna tell my brothers and sisters on Thursday that I was gay. We were going to tell my mother and father on Friday that I was gay and I was leaving the family. And then we were going to tell Colin, that's our son, on Saturday that dad is gay and he's going away. So I found a place to live um, and got that set up and I started moving, you know, surreptitiously moving myself out mm -hmm. and getting ready. So Thursday, we told my brothers, we told my brothers and sisters, everybody knew. I mean, absolutely everybody knew. Certainly the other, the two other gay kids, but the other six or whatever numbers there are. Then Friday was coming, my father and mother were supposed to come over to our house. My mother knew what was up, so she didn't, she, she caught the flu. My mother had the flu whenever she didn't want to do something. So dad came over and he goes, mom has the flu. So my father sat down with me in the kitchen at Penny's house. My father wore a, um, 
a white shirt or a light blue shirt, a long tie with a Windsor knot, a cardigan sweater, and a jacket, I think in the shower. <laughs> he wore it, this was Friday morning, he wasn't working, and he was, he had been retired by then, and he came over to, to uh, talk to me. So I said, Dad, I'm gay, uh, I am uh, leaving the house tomorrow, we, Penny and I haven't talked about divorce because that's going to be too much for Colin to hear about. But you know, so the, the, the family's breaking up. I just want you to know. And my father looked me in the eye. My father looked me in the eye. And he goes, "Billy, we've known you're homosexual all this time. We just thought you and Penny had made an arrangement." And I was, I, my jaw dropped. My, my, jaw, my father had never spoken to me about this. My, I never knew that my father. He was the last to know. <laughs> so Saturday, we told Colin we needed to talk with him. He thought, like my son to his credit wrote about this in Psychology Today, two big pages, about how, what he had, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute, I think, if I remember. But anyway, so Saturday, we said, Colin, we were having little family meetings. He, he said, oh shit, they found my beer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was 13 and a half at the time. And keep in mind, he was a, you know, he's a male, right? He's a boy, and his, and his father's a male. Anyway, so we just kind of bluntly said, uh, this is what's happening, dad is gay, and he's leaving uh, to live somewhere else tonight. And, uh, so Colin made a sound, I don't want to hear from another, from anyone else ever again, like this sort of keening, sound. He ran into his room, slammed the door, and then he came back and um, he stood in front of us over the coffee table. You know the comedian Jackie Mason, the, the Jewish comedian, that little short guy with that really thick Brooklyn accent or Bronx accent or whatever it is? So Colin stood over the coffee table and like Jackie Mason, but not of course using his accent, he said this, I'm going to use the accent because it's perfect. So he stood there and he goes, I thought you had separate bedrooms because she snores. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hilarious. And um, so the little son of a bitch did not talk to me for two years. Who didn't? Colin did not speak to me for two years. I took him to school. I cooked food for the family. I came and visited his mom. I was around. We went on outings together and stuff. But Colin did not speak a word to me for two years. And I let him. I didn't say, I'm your father, you must speak to me. I didn't address questions to him that I knew he didn't want to answer. You know, I just, he just refused to speak to me. And then, I, I think it was his friends who kind of, he's had, he has really good friends. And, I, and his friends kind of wore on him. They go, fucking Colin, what is your, what's your fucking problem? Your dad is a great guy. He loves you, he loves your mom, he's involved with your life. He, what if, so what if he's gay? And he, you know, he, he started to listen to that. And I think in a way, became authentic himself. And he wrote this beautiful long article for Psychology Today about like, I'm the one who have to, has to come out you know, about my homophobia and my you know, fears of loss and abandonment and so forth. It was a beautiful piece, actually. And now, and then he became like a poster child for B-Flag, and now we're close friends, and you know, we're just, we share everything. And we may, and the, you can tell because of the sense of humor, you know, like, like, oh, Dad, that's okay. You know, that kind of stuff is so great. So, anyway, I learned, a, I learned a lot from my brothers and sisters and, and also from my parents about being authentic. You know, I sure took my time though, didn't I? You know, and I, did, you know, I lived with guilt and regrets that I hurt Penny and I didn't uh, give her what she had on, almost always dreamt of and so forth. She just keeps telling me to shut the fuck up. <laughs> just, you know, we had a good marriage. We were married for 28 years. We raised a beautiful young man. 
getting married next month on the 10th and, uh, to a wonderful woman. And so, you know, like, choose what you see to be good, right? Because there, there is a lot there. Anyway, um, more questions? Anything about food or other stuff? I don't, I'm, I'm here for a while, right, Tim? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm going to food. Okay, yeah. Because I, I thought about this when I came in. I would just like to hear you, your comments about what is commonly called fusion food. Oh, yeah. Because I have, um, I have rather rigid opinions of some of it. Why don't you tell me yours? Go ahead. Pardon? Tell me your opinion. Well, I, I've lived in Asia for three years, mm -hmm. in the Peace Corps, and then in, in Korea, and then in Japan. And um, I love Japanese food. I love Korean food. And I will admit that when we were in Brooklyn, we had a kimchi taco, <laughs> and it was fabulous. Yeah. Because that really went together. Mm -hmm. But I have such a hard time finding, uh, especially Japanese food, anywhere in the United States, except for maybe New York City and the two coasts, which to me is authentic, blue collar, real Japanese food. Mm. And even, even, making, the, uh, even what the Japanese even what the eat Japanese now, are making it. it's like, how can you eat that? That's not, that's not, you know, you, you've, uh, I mean, soy sauce has sugar in it now, and, uh, you know, it, nobody makes, uh, no Koreans make kimchi at home anymore. They buy it all. And it seems to me like by having all this fusion food that there is a lot of um, delusion. It's, it's being dumbed down in some ways. Uh, and it just, I don't know, I find it, sometimes I find it irritating. Same thing with Mexican food. Mm -hmm. um, my introduction to Mexican food was in California. And when I went back to Delaware and went to Mexican restaurants, I said, oh my God, this is crap. So I try to not be so judgmental and realize that there, you know, there's good mergings and there can be good fusion food. But um, I still have a problem going to a restaurant and for an appetizer spending $8 on edamame. It's soybeans. Yeah, right. It costs five cents. You know, you're, you're, why, why, is it, why is a soybean all of a sudden some gourmet appetizer? Anyway, I'll shut up. No, I, just, I, I understand. I have strong feelings, yes, and do, sometimes yeah. it does not serve me well. So I'm trying to <laughs> cool down about it and still look for what I want. Um, Eat pure pepper and chilies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the authentic chill? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll also toss the ball back to you. Like, why do you pay $8 for eight of them? I don't. Okay, good. <laughs> you got to be authentic about that. You know? <laughs> yeah. They're soybeans. <laughs> no, I, I understand what you're getting at. In some ways, you know, all food is fusion when you think about it. There's yeah. so, been so many movements of foods, um, foodstuffs over the hemispheres. I wrote some really great articles I thought about the Colombian exchange, just to illustrate how, um, when I tell people that there were no tomatoes in Italy until, the, until yeah. 60, they don't believe me. They, they, they say, you're fucking, you're lying. No, 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 no it's true. Um, because we have our images of things. I, I, um, I think this, we, when we lived at Ninth and Glencoe, we lived next door to a Korean priest, and uh, the, the women of the parish came over every fall and um, made kimchi, and, and they buried it in the backyard in these massive jars, and, and, and fermented all winter long, and then they took it out in the spring, and you could smell it all over the neighborhood. It was really great, you know, but, so, I mean, but they had to use Napa cabbage from California, right? They had to use garlic from Gilroy, California, they had, you know, that's how it is, right? Was that authentic Korean kimchi? Well, I mean, you'd have to say pretty much so, right? Um, I, I, you know the, the, the slow food movement? Have you ever heard of them? They're a, it, 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 in Italy, uh, they started in Italy in the late 80s, and uh, they were 
the antithesis of fast food. You know, we've got to slow down. Fast food is just junk, which it is. It's junk all over the place. It poisons us and it ruins the animals from which we make it, and all sorts of things. Um, and we've got to get back to the sources, back to the original ways of making this cheese or raising this animal. Or it's done a lot to raise the consciousness in Italy about sources and sourcing and terroir and not, you know, like I wrote this morning, you know, don't eat asparagus except in the spring, you know, because all the other asparagus has frequent flyer miles. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that you're getting away from the source, you're getting away from the place from which this asparagus came. You're fusing it into a different place in time um, than, it, than it from which where it belongs. It belongs in the spring, out of our Colorado ground. Mm -hmm. I, for the first time in my life, I grew, I grew tomatoes this summer. Because I adore fresh tomatoes. And I go to farmer's markets and get fresh tomatoes in August and September. Um, that's why I said, what the hell? Let me, let me grow some in my little house over on 7th and uh, Emerson. And uh, <laughs> I bought uh, six plants from a, a guy named Charlie Brown. He was a councilman. Uh, <laughs> and he, he fancies himself yeah. the tomato king of Denver. So he was selling these little seedlings in April for five bucks a piece, and they were you know, like they're you know they were little dicks. I mean they were just <laughs> and they was cold in April and wet if you remember. And I would bring them in overnight, <laughs> overnight and pick them out and let them because I didn't want them to die. But I said I said to myself they're going to die. There's no way I can transplant these in, in, in the ground when it warms up in May or June. And so I went to a nursery and I bought six of the same versions, but larger. And uh, sure enough, Charlie Brown's six seedlings made it, and so did my six. So I got 12 effing tomato plants <laughs> taking over the garden. So I've had hundreds, well, dozens and dozens, almost 100 uh, fresh tomatoes of six different varieties, Cherokee Purple, Brandywine, my favorite Black Crim, it's a Russian tomato from the Crimea, um, Shoshone, Really just, and I just, I could eat a tomato sandwich or two or three every single day of the summer and not get bored. I've had tomato sandwiches for the last 30 days in a row. And I, today's was just as delicious as the first. I just adore them. And it was really cool for me to have this experience of tending this garden, getting those tomatoes from my soil, from my plants, um, at my hands. It's a wonderful experience of being, you know, close to the source, right, and, and, and tasting the deliciousness of the source. Um, I American agriculture has ruined food, not just for us, but for the world in many, many ways. And we have fused into the world and put sugar in the soy sauce and um, destroyed cooking and, and, and uh, for many, many peoples. I think maybe your anger about the, say, the Japanese cooking is that it's become facile, you know, quick. Uh, use what you can get uh, from a source that makes it cheaper and simpler. I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just guessing. Um, so maybe there are some arguments for not doing that, you know, for just going back to simple, terroir-driven, easy to make. When I wrote, I wrote a column recently about um, the sort of the simple history of Spanish cuisine, how influenced it was by 700, well, more than 700 years of Arab occupation, mm -hmm. um, the Sephardic Jews that were there, and the Christians. So these three great religions had a big influence on uh, Spanish cuisine, its development, mm -hmm. and, and on and on. There's a dish called migas, M-I-G-A-S, which is found all over. What's, again, I could have done this with the, what's the authentic recipe for migas? Well, there's a Navarre um, migas, there's a Rioja migas. There's, by the way, did you know that the ch in Rioja and Jose and so forth is Arabic in origin? Yeah, that ch, the guttural noise. And ole is also Allah. So, but they're, so they're migas all over the country. Everybody makes migas. It's now fancy in, in, in 
restaurants, you know, middle class and upper middle class restaurants to have migas, which is basically crumbs of day old or two day old bread, which, which are um, soaked in milk or water, then cooked in uh, a pan with olive oil, um, some, maybe some pork, chorizo, <coughs> or, some, or what we would call bacon, or and, and that's it. Served with an egg, maybe, not necessarily. Served with grapes, maybe, not necessarily, but migas. So I, I wrote a recipe for migas, comma, of Colorado. <laughs> this is how you make migas from stuff that's right here. And I said, you know, I encourage you to buy bread from a good bread maker here. I encourage you to use uh, Pueblo chiles if you can find them here. They do chiles and migas too. There's lots of good pork producers in the state, not many, but some, or at least locally Western. And, and on and on. And you can make migas that's Colorado. If you just pay attention to the fact that this, these are your sources. The worst thing to do would be to buy migas that's in a frozen, a package frozen from Mexico or Spain itself. What the fuck? You know? So I think that getting to the sources, getting to the terroir, touching the earth, getting the food with as few steps from where it comes to your plate is the best thing that you can possibly do. It's really difficult to do, however, with this dominance of um, trucking and transportation and, and um, desire, just plain desire. I think it's great that DIA gets fish overnight from Iceland, but I wonder, should we eat it? Should we praise it? Should we honor it? Uh, it's delicious, but so, any other questions? Or is there, are we out of time, too? Okay. okay. Any other questions? Tasha, go ahead. Well, it seems to me that all, and I, I guess, there's this concept of authenticity through sort of the foods you have access to. But what about when you kind of get combination of a dish that is basically a bunch of dishes from different places all wrapped in one. Because it seems to me that America and places like Morocco and things that have a lot of history with immigration and um, sort of merging cultures tends to get these dishes that are from all over the place. Can you give me an example of what you're thinking of? Was it made in Morocco or over in this country? It was made in Morocco. Yeah, okay. The recording of it. So? Um, and it's interesting because like Morocco is a place of like a lot of inspiration. Yeah. And you know, you always like Spanish influences. Sure, and African and Arab and Arabian and yeah. French. Yes, you know. lots of French. So. Well, Sort of the question comes down almost in every place that I've ever studied or taught about. Um, is there such a thing as, and I'll just use our country as an example, is there such a thing as American cooking? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> there's New England cooking, there's you know, Tex-Mex. 
Dad's cooking either. There's, and, and then there's this crazy American cooking too. You know, like there's Pennsylvania Dutch, and there's fast food cooking, and frozen dinner cooking. And, you know, dude, we're we're just and we're just, we're mi you know all mixed up too. And lots of different kinds of things. Yeah, it's, everywhere you look, there's like Indian restaurants, it's like a Peruvian restaurant. Well, yeah, there's restaurants. Those are different things than just cooking. You know, but they try to imitate or offer the f kinds of foods on their menus that are typical from the country from which they come. They have to use products that they get from. But they're in America and consumed in yeah, They're allowed to be in America. America. What? Well, they're in America and they're consumed and enjoyed by Americans. Yeah. So, does that not count as cuisine that we in America enjoy? Yeah. But I think uh, Bob was saying that sometimes, you know, the foods that are supposedly Japanese aren't really J Japanese. They look like it, they smell like it, they have the Japanese names, but they're just not so Japanese. It's like miso soup. Right. I mean, again, I'm being kind of narrow-minded here, but you don't make miso soup with chicken stock. Correct. It's made with dashi, it's fish. Right. And that, you know, I mean, you would never have that, well, actually I can't, I haven't been to Japan in Brazilian years, but it's, it's things like that. When I went to a restaurant, I was so excited to have some miso soup, and I thought, oh my god, what is this? So I have to shift and say, okay, this is this is soup. This is miso. something that they call miso <laughs> right. soup, yeah. and that's okay. It's good. It's just not what was in my expectations, I guess. No, it wasn't. And, um, that's difficult to deal with, dashed expectations. So is the rule of authenticity the I don't know that there is any rule to authenticity. I just did a little bit of searching to say that the closer to the source, the more authentic the dish. But that, that, does, and that doesn't, what does that mean closer to the source? Um, that means you, you must never call miso soup authentic if it has any chicken broth in it. Well, yes. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Easy. But, it, but you'll eat it and you'll pay for it and it's delicious. But it's not authentic. Because it's not it's not no it's nowhere close it's not close to the source, it's far away from the source. So what is the authentic source for the kind of five plan meals that you get from learning cultures? I don't know, I guess it's sort of like <laughs> it's like the pride flag, right? It's just diversity in one, one in one place. Is that allowed? Certainly. Oh, but you seem to be making an argument that it isn't. Well I'm not making an argument. Two feet from it, you're, that, you're you're really close. <laughs> you're you're being authentically diverse, okay? And I think that's allowed um, and and can be embraced. Um, so, but this I'm talking about canons, you know, like recipes that are set in, in print, and and, um, and we use them as guidelines. So. But if, if you make a hodgepodge and have a diverse crowd, you know, and a pride flag and a other kinds of things, you know, that's okay. It's authentically diverse. <laughs> it's just not authentically miso. Whatever. So I just wanted to make a comment on fusion. The, when I lived in Peru, Chifa restaurants, Chinese Peruvian restaurants, it was a whole cuisine unto itself. Right. And it had been there for hundreds of years because the Chinese had come to Peru hundreds of years ago. And it had developed over the centuries. And it was authentic chifa restaurants, chifa food. Yeah, I enjoyed that when I was visiting there myself. I ate my first kui, too. Oh. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I thought it was just delicious. And it didn't taste like chicken. <laughs> <laughs>